करुणाम करुणा तरंगताक्षी धृत पाशांगुश पुष्पाणचापिरावृता मयूख अहम विभावये भवानी नमस्ते and welcome to the next episode in our ongoing series on Sri Lalita Sahasranama the thousand holy names of the great goddess uh she's Lalita first of all she's playful uh, she's not serious this whole creation is just her sport her leela leela means pastimes it's not something you have to do it's like play like sport <laughs> fun so she's having fun with all the rest of us we're taking it very seriously <laughs> but actually nothing can destroy the immortal soul so no matter what happens in this world whether things go well or they don't go so well there's a pandemic or a war or some nonsense like that it's just her drama she likes drama she likes to play so she wants to entertain shiva so she makes all this stuff happen and to us it seems you know very serious and and severe but actually from the purview of the soul it's just another passing event you know here today gone tomorrow this too shall pass so with that let's continue going into her names in uh, the form of her benedictions to her devotees nama 116 bhadra murtihi She is the embodiment of auspiciousness as confirmed by Nama 200 Sarva Mangala. This is because she is also addressed as Shri Shiva Nama 998 which means auspiciousness. Brahman alone is auspicious. Therefore, she is addressed here as Brahman Vishnu Sahasranam also says Mangalanam cha Mangalam meaning the best among the auspicious her very form is most auspicious so bhadra means auspiciousness and murtihi means the form so her form her very form is most auspicious she's the most beautiful and attractive to shiva therefore she is also known as shiva uh, the feminine form of the absolute brahman saguna brahman brahman with qualities as opposed to shiva who represents nirguna brahman brahman without qualities so the two of them together are necessary huh Don't think like the neo advaitins do that if you attain brahman you can just drop the goddess or her worship or ignore her qualities and her power <laughs> it's not very healthy to do that in fact it's asking for trouble women do not like being ignored So the best thing we can do for ourselves and others is to worship her. It's very easy. All we have to do is remember her names. She has so many names, a thousand names in this scripture. And in the Lalita Trishati, she has 300 more. <laughs> and if we look in the scriptures, we can find hundreds and hundreds more names. All of them are deeply meaningful. and very auspicious 
So when we chant and remember these names, then we start attracting good fortune. This is my experience. Huh? Even after enlightenment and samadhi and nirvana and all these attainments, in my material life, I was still unfortunate and disturbed and unhappy. But then I started investigating this Sri Vidya and everything has changed externally. Internally is still the same. But externally, so much good fortune has come just by remembrance of her name and her form. Nama 117. Bhakta Saubhagya Dayani. She confers prosperity on her devotees. There is a reference to Saubhagya Ashtagam, eight things that give prosperity in Agni Purana. They are sugarcane, the peepal tree, ficus religiosa or sacred fig, also known as the Bodhi tree sprouted jira, cumin seeds, coriander, cow's milk and its modifications, curd, butter, and ghee, and everything that is yellow in color, flowers, and salt. All these indicate auspiciousness and prosperity. The next three namas discuss bhakti, devotion, so sometimes people complain to me that, oh, I have to work so hard, I don't have time for sadhana. Well, you have time for work because that brings prosperity, right? But there's a deeper cause to prosperity, and that is good karma. So when we worship her, especially when we worship her through bhakti or divine love, then she brings all auspiciousness and wealth, huh? bhadra, auspiciousness, and saubhagya. Saubhagya means the greatest wealth. What is the greatest wealth? Spiritual knowledge and realization. Why is that? Because it removes all troubles. <laughs> it mitigates all sorrows. See, the material world is the world of the cheaters and the cheated. All of us are cheaters and all of us are cheated in different ways, isn't it? The greatest cheating is that this body will eventually betray us and fail and pass away. But we have her, that is, we the devotees have her. <laughs> in the form of her holy name and her service. And this will never pass away. This is saubhagya. This is the real wealth. Huh? Every time a, a good astrologer looks at my chart, they say, holy cow, you're a very wealthy man. You must be like Bill Gates, you know? <laughs> or who is it now? What's the... the SpaceX guy, Elon Musk, huh? But actually I tell them I don't have much money, just enough to live comfortably, and that's enough. But my real wealth is the spiritual wisdom and realization that comes from worshiping her. Nama 118, Bhakti Priya. She is fond of devotion. Shivananda Lahari. Lahari means to rise up in waves. Verse 61 describes devotion. The way a needle seeks a magnet, the way a creeper seeks a tree, the way a river unites with the ocean, and the way the mind seeks the lotus feet of Shiva are called devotion. Sage Narada said, Devotion is beyond the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. It is beyond desire. It grows every second. It remains connected with Brahman. It is subtle and realized out of experience. Once realized, 
one always remains with that. So devotion is sometimes described as love, but it's something special. It's beyond ordinary love. It's the love of a transcendental object. This is key. And the reason it's key is because in the material world, the objects of our love are temporary, impermanent, and imperfect. And also they're not self, with a capital S. Or actually they're not self with a small s either. <laughs> they're other. In duality, we make a distinction between self and other. But in the world of the absolute, there is no distinction. There is only self. My Adi Guru put it this way. In the absolute, one plus one equals one. So in spiritual life, when we are together with our Ishta Devata, our worshipable deity, we don't feel like there's two. There's only one. One heart, one love, one desire. And that desire is not ordinary desire either. That's what the scripture says when it means there's no desire in bhakti. Actually, there is desire. It's just that the object of that desire is transcendental. Bhakti rasa or bhakti bhava, which means a transcendental emotion that is fully satisfying to the soul. And there are five main flavors, neutrality, servitorship, parenthood, friendship, and conjugal love. These five flavors of bhakti have sub-flavors uh, which are harmonious with their uh, pastimes and attitudes. So the whole uh, actual subject of bhakti rasa is extremely elaborate and deep. But the main point is that we find a form of God that completely satisfies us. And what form could be more satisfying than our mother? Our mother is the one who bears us, creates us, raises us up, takes care of us, consoles us when we're sad, celebrates when we're happy, and so on, shares all of our life with us. This is the great mother, the universal mother, and she is present everywhere, so she's always with us. This is the ultimate object of love. Viveka Chudamani 31 says, Amongst things conducive to liberation, devotion alone holds the supreme place. Seeking after one's real nature is designated as devotion. Others maintain that inquiry into the truth of one's own self is devotion. The point driven home in this Nama is that nothing prevents a true devotee in realizing her, irrespective of any hurdles. She is delighted with such devotion and such devotees. Devotees are those who worship her through the mind, seeking her within. So we've done a whole series on Ananya Bhakti. Ananya Bhakti means love of the self with a capital S. And it doesn't make our love any less to understand that Brahman, the Supreme, is our very self. The love of the other is always flawed. It's impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self, by definition, because it involves the other as the object. Whereas love of the self alone has no other as its object, it has only itself. And this is the highest love. So we should strive to develop that love. And this is the true Priya, huh? the beloved, the dear one, the object of our affections. Nama 119, Bhakti Gamya. She can be attained only by devotion. 
Since she likes pure devotion in terms of the previous nama, she can be attained by such devotion only. The Upanishads explain devotion in detail. Brahma Sutra 3.2.24 says, Brahman is realized in samadhi, as known from direct revelation and inference. Chandogya Upanishad 2.23.1 says, Brahmasang stong ritatvang me ti. One devoted to Brahman attains immortality. Attaining immortality means mukti, as discussed in Nama 112. This is possible only through devotion. Kata Upanishad 2.1.1 says, Self-created God has also created the sense organs with the inherent defect that they are by nature outgoing. This is why beings see things outside and cannot see the self within. Taitriya Upanishad 2.1 says, Satyang Jnanam Anantang Brahma Truth, knowledge, and infinity is Brahman. Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras 123 says, by devotion to Ishwara. Krishna confirms this in Bhagavad Gita 1855. One can understand me by devotional service, and when he is in full consciousness of me by such devotion, he can enter my kingdom. And in 1154, I can be understood as I am only by undivided devotional service and can thus be seen directly. Lalita Trishati 192 Labdha Bhakti Sulabha confirms that she can be attained only by devotion. Brahman can be realized either through Bhakti Marg, the path of devotion, or through jnana marg, the path of knowledge. In the devotional path, divine grace is an essential factor. While pursuing the path of knowledge, self-effort is primary. In bhakti, one affirms this world, affirms himself and his life and work with a devoted remembrance of his ishtabdevata. Among all the disciplines of worship, bhakti is considered as supreme. The desperate longing and intense love for Ishtadevata is known as Bhakti Rati. The intense search for our true nature is Bhakti. The one noticeable yet significant difference between Bhakti and Jnana is the difference in the perception of the Supreme. In Bhakti, one searches for and perceives Ishtadevata. And in jnana, one looks for formless Brahman. So devotion here is characterized into four categories. The yogic approach, or the approach through knowledge and will, relies on the individual's effort. While in bhakti, one relies on divine grace. <laughs> It's the lazy man's path to enlightenment. <laughs> In the yoga approach, one tries to control everything by the will. And, and this is just exhausting. It requires constant effort. And one little slip up, you know, and you can fall down completely. The story of Vishvamrita is illustrative in this regard. Vishvamitra was meditating in the forest, and Indra looked down and saw him and said, uh-oh, this guy has enough punya, he could take over my post. So he sent one of his dancing girls, one of his heavenly prostitutes, Menaka, very beautiful woman. My Adi guru described that the heavenly dancing girls are so beautiful that a human man, it, just seeing them, will immediately pass semen. Just by seeing them, they're so beautiful. 
So this Menaka approached Vishvamrita and said, you know, let's, let's get together. <laughs> and of course, he couldn't do anything to resist her. And she had him wrapped around her little finger. <laughs> For 10,000 years, they sported in the forest together. And then one morning, Vishvamitra kind of wakes up and realizes, oh my God, I've wasted all this time just sporting with this woman. And so he cursed her and said, get out of here. And he went back to his sadhana. So this is the thing. <laughs> Any little slip up in the practice of yoga can lead to major fall down. But on the path of bhakti, we're not responsible. Huh? The ishta devata, the ultimate form of worship, the god or goddess to whom we are devoted is responsible. And the divine grace, grace of guru, grace of God, uh, grace of good fortune, saubhagya, uh, this is the actual active force. So in other words, in devotional service, we do our seva, we do our bhakti, and we simply trust and wait for the result. We don't push, we don't nag. <laughs> uh, we may beg, yes, that's allowed. <laughs> and, and we may become desperately longing for the object of our bhakti desire. But it, goddess knows all. She knows our hearts and she knows the sincerity and depth of our love. And she rewards us actually appropriately at every moment. This is the, the special flavor, this is the special characteristic of the bhakti path that by endeavoring to find our true nature, we find that ourselves and our deity are one. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.